America today. So I want to tell you a little bit more about um, Kenji. Kenji is a violist, so that's a good thing. He's also a remarkable composer and his compositional gift is really wide ranging, but the thing that's really striking to me is that he manages to integrate a really fluent command of folk and roots music of the American vernacular, whether it's pop or blues or hip hop or jazz with the mainstream of 20th century, 21st century American classical music. And he does it in a way that's compelling and engaging. And you can tell that that's true because he's been played by dozens and dozens of orchestras across the United States. States. His music's been premiered by the Seattle Symphony and the Oregon Symphony and uh, Grant Park and lots of other big orchestras. He has been commissioned and performed all over the United States, recorded. And finally, a remarkable guy writing for strings because he's a great string player himself. He manages to write idiomatic, idi idiomatic music that string players love. Um, and so with all that said, welcome, Kenji. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh, Troy, thank you. Thank you for such a, a wonderful introduction. And, and uh, that, that made my, my week. That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're somebody, you and I are, are, I'm a little older than you are, I think, but we're about the same age and we kind of grew up with a lot of mutual friends but we didn't get to work together until several years into our careers. But I've always admired you from honestly, the way my friends talked about you and the music of yours that I got to know before I was able to program and conduct your music myself. And so I've, I feel like I'm a fan who got the chance to sort of be a friend. And I'm really grateful for that opportunity because you're a remarkable guy. Oh, thanks. Man. Well, you know, likewise, because I, uh, I'm also from the Pacific Northwest, uh, spend summers in Vermont where there's the, the legend of Troy Peters still looms large. And <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it's been an honor for me. Yeah. Well, and so let's learn more about that coming from the Pacific Northwest and what that journey was like. One of the things we always try to do on the Oso Live Chats is I get to know how you became a musician. What was it? What did you do as a teenager in music? And then what led you to think, you know what, maybe this is a career. Yeah, well, I I had some unique opportunities uh, as a really little kid um, that, you, you know, you, you grow up not realizing how uh, special they are until years later, then you think, huh, not everyone got to do that. And that was really lucky. And that's why I ended up uh, doing what I do. And um, for me, it was that I my parents uh, are music lovers. They're, they're not musicians. I, I don't come from a musical family. But uh, my mother in particular was um, a lover of opera. And starting from uh, the age of three, I, I, uh, I saw a lot of opera. Um, it, it, and it was sort of a logistical thing that happened because um, my, my dad taught uh, political science at Portland State here in, in Portland for, for years. And in 1976, when I was three, he was on sabbatical. And we spent that sabbatical uh, traveling Europe. Um, we, we flew to London and he bought an old car. And th this is something you could sort of do back in the 70s and just drive around all over Europe. And uh, so we had no no plans, no contacts, no, no way to arrange for childcare. And my mom wanted to see operas. And we were in places like uh, uh, Milan, you know, she want, she's heard of La Scala, she wanted to go there. So we would go, to, uh, I sat through uh, Otello at, at La Scala. Um, it, it, and it, again, years later, I came across the program for that and it was Placido Domingo, uh, Carlos Kleiber conducting all this. And, and, you know, I, I'm sitting there, I, obviously I don't remember uh, that experience really, uh, but uh, from anyway, from an early age, I, I was attending these long operas, uh, concerts regularly, and they kind of, even when we were at home, they did the math and figured that it was actually more affordable to bring us with them than to hire a babysitter. <laughs> so my brother and I uh, would, would attend a lot of um, concerts. 
And so basically my, my whole life as I remember it as uh, the concert going experience has been this really special thing and um, music was just always a part of my life. Um, and my dad's influence is that he uh, enjoyed classical music, but was also a big fan of uh, the music of his time. He's um, uh, from the, he was born in, in 1927. So he, he's really a, a, a man of the thirties and forties. And, and so I, I grew up on a lot of um, swing era jazz and um, uh, Broadway, like golden age of, of Broadway musicals and all of that. And I, I never made the distinction between uh, highbrow or lowbrow uh, with any of that material. And um, they, they never made that distinction for me either. So I kind of received everything with the same ears and have kept on doing that. Um, in high school, I got into uh, listening anyway, not, not playing really, but I got into uh, more you know, rock and uh, popular music and and um, yeah, so that, that's that's my early childhood experience that was special, I guess. Started. And what led you to the? Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, so I started uh, my. Uh, so I have a brother; he's a year older, and we started piano um, and violin at the same time. I was maybe four when I started piano, and five when I started violin. And uh, we'd play together a lot. Uh, we did everything together. His name is Genji. Uh, and so we were, he's a year older, but we were dressed like twins and, uh, everyone thought we were the same person and, uh, we did everything <laughs> together. I switched to the viola, uh, when I was 13 for two reasons. One was I wanted to get into the Portland Youth Philharmonic. Um, and when I auditioned, they, they didn't need any violins, but they said they could use a viola right away. So I said, Hey, I, I'll do. Uh, so that was one reason. The other was I wanted to do something different from Genji. And, but then Genji switched to the viola too, and we both played in, in PYP for five years. That's funny. And then you ended up in New York. What, what led you on that path? So you're, you're, you're growing up, you love music of all kinds of different eras and different styles. You're playing in a, one of the America's greatest youth orchestras and America's oldest youth orchestra, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And, um, then you were, you know, but, but what, at what point do you say, oh, maybe I want to do this? And how does that get you to New York? Yeah, well, um, w as a young violinist, I was not, um, I, I, I wasn't like turning heads <laughs> that, that much. I, I wasn't a, a prodigy by any means. And in fact, I think I was uh, somewhat of a, disappointment in a certain way. I, I, I just, I didn't, um, I didn't know how to practice. And, and that's a, a problem for kids who don't come from a musical family. I mean, not to put it on my parents, they, they, they did their, their best to help and they were extremely supportive, but um, it's hard to know how to uh, help somebody, you know, other than say, go practice for an hour. Um, it's hard to, to give much uh, guidance. And um, I, I actually, when I was maybe 12, I got fired by my teacher um, for not uh, performing up to his standards. And, uh, and that was a, a blow, you know, that, that was discouraging. I, I kind of didn't play much for a while. Um, I was playing in my school orchestra, but that was about it. Back then, the middle school had a string program. And um, then I heard about PYP somehow. I think we, we saw, we went to a concert of, of uh, the Youth Philharmonic and that got me excited again. And I, I wanted to uh, join. And something about switching to the viola um, that, that helped me. I found a, a new teacher who was really great at helping me learn how to practice. And uh, it, so it wasn't really until I was in high school that I got serious uh, as a musician. And then um, when I was uh, in my, my junior year of high school, 
uh, PYP had a, a scholarship available for uh, to, to send one student to the uh, Boston University Tanglewood Institute. And I um, auditioned for that and did not win. I, but I was the runner up uh, to a, a wonderful clarinetist. Uh, and then unfortunately, uh, about a week before Tanglewood, she somehow f fell and hurt her I had nothing to do with it. I, I was nowhere. <laughs> and, and so I, uh, last minute, was sent as the, the alternate. And um, that experience really changed my life. I, um, I, you know, PYP was, was definitely a huge uh, inspiration. But then going to this um, summer festival where the, the top uh, kids my age from around the country were uh, all, all there together, uh, and they were all super serious and all wanting to go into music. That made me think, whoa, th this would be fun, and, and uh, this is what I want to do. Uh, so I came back from, from there thinking that's what I want to do. I want to go into music. Um, I, it, uh, it's, it's different growing up as a musician in a, a place other than the big East Coast hubs, because uh, you just don't know things. I didn't know who the teachers were. I, I, I had no connections with anyone. Um, I had heard of the Juilliard School. I thought, uh, you know, people talk about that. That sounds like, like the place I should. So I, I applied to a few places. Um, I, I, I couldn't make the Curtis audition date, so I, didn't, I couldn't apply to Curtis. Uh, but I applied to, to Juilliard. I flew there. Um, stayed with a friend of a friend that my dad knew on a pullout sofa, um, went to the audition. They, they give you a, a room to warm up in. And I was so tired from the, the flight. I, I think I took the red eye or something. And, oh no, I took the, the late flight, got in late at night, um, got up early in the morning. And I, I was in this warm up room and I, I just crawled under the piano and took a nap. And then my, I met my pianist and I was amazed that he knew the music I was going to play for my audition. Like, whoa, how did you know the Bartok concerto? And uh, of course he knows everything. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, then I, I auditioned, I was lucky enough to get accepted. And um, that's how I started that, that, um, that path. So at what point did you become a composer? Were you already writing music at the end of high school? And, or is that something that started later? How did yeah, that happen for you? It started later. Um, I was in high school, I was fascinated by composers and I, I wanted to be a composer. And in fact, I used to carry manuscript paper around with me at school um, just to sort of doodle on. Uh, but I didn't have the tools to actually compose. I, I never had any theory training. Um, everything I, I learned, I, I would just, you know, find books and read up on stuff myself, but I, I didn't have any direction. And in fact, when I got to Juilliard, I, uh, they give you a theory placement test and I flunked it um, because I, I was, I didn't even make first year theory. I was put in theory fundamentals. <laughs> and uh, then I was really lucky to uh, to find a teacher who uh, a really great teacher and also a, a wonderful composer Eric Wazen, who um, was really encouraging and I mean he's just like a super encouraging guy uh, in any case but he could tell that I was enthusiastic about this and that I was trying to compose and and he would encourage me and give me advice outside of class and eventually I, I stayed with with his, in his class I you know eventually made it up to my regular years theory uh, class uh, but I, I stuck with him and and uh, by the end of my four years there I had a portfolio of stuff to apply to the um, graduate program as a double major in, in viola and composition and so that's how I, I got into it so it was really I, I was maybe 19 or so when I, I started to compose uh, seriously. So do you have advice you would give for young musicians who are 
orchestral players and developing their instrumental skill, but starting to think about writing. Maybe they've improvised a little bit or written some pieces for their own instrument. How do they find their way into composition? How do you start? Yeah, um, I, as I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, it, it, it can be presented often as an intimidating undertaking to, to write music. And, um, and that, that ha it happens so much in the field of classical music that, uh, you know, you want to do something and then you're presented with all the reasons why that would be really hard to do. And, uh, are you sure you really want to do that? Cause that's a lot of work and you, you've got to do blah, blah, blah. And, and, um, you, you know, I, on, on the one hand, that's, good advice because anything we do, we, we should approach with respect and um, with an understanding that it's gonna take a lot of work. But um, in this case, I, th I often think uh, people who are curious about composing music, uh, you know, instrumentalists who, who wanna compose, um, they, they're intimidated and they, they think that they don't have uh, the special skills that one needs in order to do this. And uh, what I found in my experience was, um, it, sure, I was extremely intimidated. And even when I got in that graduate program, I thought I was way behind everybody else. And I, I was in, in a lot of ways. I, I had no experience. I, uh, everyone else had had harmony and counterpoint and all this stuff. And I had to catch up on all, all that stuff. Um, on the other hand, there were people in that program who didn't really play an instrument. Um, they didn't have the experience of being on a stage performing music for, for other people. They, did, they didn't have the instincts that one develops spending time learning and uh, practicing and performing music. And so I, what I tell people is that you, you know more than you think you do. Um, and you, your ears know more than you think they do. That, uh, they, uh, they've listened to so much music over the years and they, um, they learn things from th those experiences and they remember things, whether you think you do or not. And they're going to help you if you trust them and, uh, you know, let them lead the way. And, um, if, if you, uh, so it's, you know, going with, with that, instinct that we develop as a performer and uh, just having some patience with yourself and some uh, belief that, that yes, you do have something unique to say and that uh, there are only 12 notes in our uh, traditional scale, but um, uh, you can do something with those 12 notes that no one else has done exactly in that way. I love that idea of, of trusting your ears because I think one of the problems that's so prevalent in classical music instruction, whether it's for performers or for composers or for conductors or anybody, is uh, not enough focus on trusting your ears. Um, you know, and it, and for me in my career, I found my collaborative work with rock musicians has really pushed me to use my ears better and to, yeah. you know, I, when I worked with Trey Anastasio from Fish, he was, he was so amazing and fluent and he's sitting with his guitar and playing and singing at the same time. And I'm like Salieri in the movie Amadeus <laughs> trying to write down what he's, what yeah. he's singing. Um, and it really made me think like, I should be able to do this. I should be able yeah. to speak the language he's speaking. And I, and I, I got better at it with with that work. Yeah. Um, speaking of of the language and the especially your really uh, powerfully distinctive personal voice, uh, we do have a question from Olivia Varon who wanted to ask about how do you find your personal style? What did you do to practice composing to find your personal style as a composer? Well, I, um, it's it's a good question and it's it's one we all think about, um, I, I never decided that I, 
uh, oh, this is going to be my my personal my voice as a composer. I I, I never. It was never an intentional thing, really. Um, I, I guess I, I made a decision. It, it, the only decision I really ever made was that I would write music that I wanted to hear, and that that would be um, my, my really only goal. Because um, why do it if I for any other reason? Uh, and. Um, I very early on as a composer, I gave up any um, pretensions of impressing people with my um, intellect, I guess, or, or uh, doing doing something that would would be uh, not to say that that writing incredibly um, complex and uh, music that's interesting architecturally, uh, not that that's not a valid thing to do. And I enjoy that music. I, I like playing it. I, I like listening to it, but I, I don't really uh, write that way. And uh, I, I just want to write things that I want to hear. And um, I, I try my best to uh, write with the best craft I can. But I, I like to tell stories, uh, I, I like history. I, I like creative writing, things like that. And, and so I, I, I just want to kind of make believe, uh, create these these worlds with my music. And I, uh, sometimes I think of it as if I'm a a film director. Um, you know, like for instance, uh, Ang Lee is a, a film director. He he directed a martial arts epic, um, a, a superhero film, uh, a, a gay cowboy romance, uh, all these like very different uh, English period piece. Um, so if you saw all those films, you wouldn't necessarily think they had the same, they obviously don't have the same look or the same uh, kind of storytelling, but there are aspects that uh, if you look closely enough, you you could see that it's the same person trying to tell these stories, and and I, I guess that's what I I try to do. I I try to lose myself in whatever world I'm in, immersed in. Um, but it, as we do when we travel, um, we go places to learn about other places, but we also go there to learn about ourselves. And and so I I, I like to uh, throw myself into some musical world and see who I am in that context with that vocabulary. And I try to, to remain, um, I, I, I try to uphold the integrity of that vocabulary, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, as you're finding your way as a composer though, did you ever face uh, pushback or pressure, whether from peers and colleagues or from teachers? about that that question of whether your music was complicated enough or whether your music was fancy enough. Um, I remember showing a score to a colleague when I was about 22 and having him say, yeah, I mean, this seems like a nice piece, but if you wrote those as 30 second notes instead of eighth notes, they would be more likely to win a competition. Um, <laughs> did you run into that kind of thing? And yeah, sure, um, I, I did, I mean, uh, I, I, I consider myself lucky to have uh, come up through my schooling when I did, because I think 10 years before that, it would have been way harder. Um, I was in school in the early 90s and, and the, the air had cleared to a certain extent then um, and, and because uh, before that. And I think, I don't, I don't know if young, younger musicians understand how uh, different that that must have been but from that period from the 50s to the 80s that that was like you had to write serial uh you know post webern serialist music or or else you were uh, uh you know a wacko <laughs> right <laughs> or, or at least superficial unserious yeah yeah um and i had some funny i remember um when i was at school milton babbitt was uh, on the faculty and and he was, he's a wonderful 
guy and composer and teacher and uh, to his credit was very open to a lot of different things other than his very specific uh, approach to music. Um, but there was a funny moment in a, a student composer recital. Uh, my teacher, Bob Beezer, who I studied with, he told me this later because they were sitting together and I had written a, a solo cello piece that my friend Dave Egar played, and it was it was called Crawl Space, and it was um, this uh, like power chord classic rock uh, kind of Hendrixy piece, and and um, it, you know blues pentatonic kind of thing the, the whole way, and and my teacher later told me that. Uh, as the piece finished, Babbitt turned to him and said, uh, I think your boy's gone mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, we had another great question. Ramona Douglas asked, um, what might be a tough question, but I think is always an interesting one to think about. What was one of your all-time favorite projects to work on? And that can be as a composer or some other aspect of your musicianship. But, you know, when you think of back over your career, what was a, what was a, a great project, a great, exciting highlight? That's a good question. Um, one of them for sure, I would have to say, well, the two things come to mind. Um, one, I used to play with this wonderful group called Next Works in New York. Um, and it, we called ourselves a, a group of composing performers or performing composers. I can't remember which one it was, but anyway we we composed and performed our own we we approached the group like a band would you bring your own material to the the group and there was um our kind of our leader uh was Joan LaBarbera uh who comes out of the New York school tradition of uh John Cage and his contemporaries and um so we played a lot of Jones music and I had this opportunity to write a chamber opera for, for Joan. It was a one person opera uh, based on a, a Japanese book I had read by uh, Kobo Abe, uh, The Women in the Dunes. And uh, it, we, we had a residency in uh, this, it was called the Issue Project Room. And at that point they were in an abandoned grain silo in, uh, on the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn. This is really funky, space um and uh, so i wrote this chamber opera that was almost all it, it improvised with graphic notation and all that and we we played mostly in the dark and we had these i ordered these headlamp flashlights and um we surrounded joan and and most of it took place in the dark and we performed it you know, it's a super obscure venue and uh, this pretty like avant-garde um, group. And there were maybe seven people in the audience when we performed it. And um, somehow by some miracle, one of those seven people was Alex Ross from the New Yorker. And, and he enjoyed the, uh, the show and wrote about it and it, it um, it sounds like it was something that, um, you know, people knew about, but it was just, it's, but anyway, it was, it was such a, a great experience, um, doing the, it was, that's the only time we ever did it. It was just that, that, uh, performance, the, the entire sets and scores and props are in my storage shed. So, um, and the other one I, I'd say, um, uh, working on Embrace with, with Tracy and, uh, going around to, I think it was, it was over 10 orchestras, including Yosa. Uh, that was so, uh, so great an experience to, uh, take this kind of modular piece. It, it, the project was to write, um, something that kind of involved orchestras on different levels, uh, some youth orchestras, some, uh, adult amateur groups and some professional. And compositionally, that was a tough uh, riddle to solve, to, to write music that would be rewarding for people at all those different levels. Um, and 
what we ended up coming coming up with was was just a, a neat uh, flexible uh, work that was very different everywhere we did it and that's what I wanted and th that's kind of something that uh, has increasingly been interesting to me I want every um, every performance to somehow be a unique experience and you know these days when we're not able to gather together for for live performing um, I, I think about that so much how uh, uh, how lucky uh, we are to have those experiences uh, together in the same room and, and uh, that they really exist only in that that moment and for those of you who aren't familiar with Embrace, uh, it was a concerto for the electric violinist Tracy Silverman, who is uh, really, like Kenji, a really uh, omnivorous kind of musician, a guy who can play just about anything and who has premiered, you know, works by major composers like John Adams and Nico Muley, but also plays pop music and folk music and all kinds of different things with just this incredible fluency. And Kenji and Tracy really worked together on this piece. It's Kenji's piece. And yet they, they had this symbiotic relationship as um, guest artists where they could, they could improvise together when we did classroom visits, where the, the piece really sounded like Kenji, but also really presented Tracy in this really compelling and beautiful way. It was a great project. So, oh, um, Another question that's come up is uh, one of, uh, we have a young violinist named David Escamilla who asked, what genre of music do you like best? You can only pick one. <laughs> that's, you can dodge that's, that question too. Well, I, I've never, um, I've never, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be 47 later in July and I've gone this long without picking one. Um, and I, I, I'm going to see how long I can go without having to do that. <laughs> there you go. Because I, well, I that like brings, it all. Yeah, well, that brings me to something I wanted to point people to. Um, in this time of the pandemic, and then especially in this time uh, where in the last several weeks when a lot of us are turning our focus to racial justice and social justice, unfortunately more than we usually do, where the country is spending more time on this topic. Um, I should say fortunately, but it's also unfortunate, right? It's not yeah. something that we've spent enough time engaging with and wrestling with. For a lot of us, you've been a really compelling online presence with this just very simple thing of presenting little snippets of music with you and your viola playing unexpected songs. <laughs> and I don't know that that's intentional on your part as a, as a social justice gesture, but it resonates that way for a lot of us. Um, so I wondered if you could just talk more about that. What, what, what is it that makes you turn to um, breaking out the viola and playing some new Jack swing? Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, what is that? What is that? Then that, that doesn't have to be just about the present moment. You've also told a beautiful story about visiting schools with artists who maybe were less receptive to other styles of music. And, so I wonder if you could just talk to that talk, that topic of what it means as a string player and composer to embrace these different styles and, and wh why are you doing that? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think all of us um, who are here listening and um, who play instruments and who usually perform, um, we all have this, uh, this reckoning um, to do right now, like what do we do with our instruments? Um, what do we practice? What, what, what are we supposed to be doing? And I, for me, uh, it, it was funny. Um, this the the shutdown happened right at probably the the busiest time in of my year. Um, I had a bunch of music I was trying to write. I just happened to be playing, I had a, a one-year contract in the viola section for the Oregon Symphony. I was playing their full season. We were almost every night um, hitting it uh, with, with concerts in February. And 
I, uh, you know, I was, I would fi find myself exhausted, like, oh, got to put on the concert clothes again. Okay, go play a concert. And, and then all of a sudden that stops and like, wait a minute, uh, what do I do now? Like, and I realized it has been a, a long time since I practiced something because I wanted to and not because I desperately had to uh, for whatever rehearsal was coming up the next day or, you know, and so there, it was kind of a wake up call. Like, like what am I doing? Um, and what do I want to do as a violist? Like what's, um, there's a, uh, I, I heard something on the radio about how, um, uh, there was a, a marriage counselor, uh, this famous marriage counselor in, in Belgium, uh, Estelle Perel, I think is her name. And she was saying that, that this kind of experience when we're all, um, uh, in quarantine together, it's an accelerator uh, for relationships. It makes you, uh, what was going to happen with your relationship, it speeds that up because you're around each other. It makes perfect sense. And in some ways, the same thing happened between me and my viola. Um, it accelerated that relationship uh, and moved us on the trajectory we were leaning. And uh, what I realized I want to do on the instrument and what I, you know, I would just find myself picking it up and playing the most ridiculous stuff. And, and um, then you know, at first it would seem ridiculous. And then I, I think, well, wait a minute, I can actually kind of do that. And then I would think, well, no, I can't do that. That doesn't, that's too hard. And I think, wait a minute, I, uh, why would I stop trying after, you know, five minutes of, uh, seeing if I could do this um, instead of practicing it the way I would practice anything else that um, may be hard, but you just dig in and, and grind it out. Right. You couldn't I, play the Bartok concerto when you first picked it up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and uh, it, it, it's kind of this, uh, this learned helplessness that, that we, we have uh, where we, we, just think, oh, that's too hard. I can't do that. You can't do that on a string instrument. That's not possible. Um, but then if you uh, just give it a second and think, but wait a minute, actually, it's just a collection of 16th notes. And if I figure out a, a way to make that pattern happen just on my instrument, I can kind of do that. And then if I can break down the rhythm to figure out how to say the words on top of what I'm doing, and if I slow it down enough so that I can develop that coordination, I can maybe do that. And I, I found myself spending hours working on this and I would, I would go to sleep at night, imagining playing this rhythm and saying these <laughs> words or singing or whatever it was. And it, it just gave me this, uh, I, I was reinvigorated as a, a musician and, and it, it seemed like I don't know what I, ever this is going to amount to, but um, it's fun. And then I just started posting these videos, and uh, it, people seemed to enjoy them. And then I, I realized maybe that's not the worst thing in the world to put this out there uh, to show, um, it, it, particularly on the viola. I, I I like to present the viola doing unusual things and doing things that people don't expect a viola to be able to do. And, and I thought, well, you know, uh, maybe that's what I can offer. Maybe that's what my contribution to the viola world. Uh, I can show that it's, it's a flexible instrument capable of um, uh, some uh, unusual things. And, and then, uh, yeah, the, the styles of music, there's no reason not to put time into those styles too. There, uh, people who play that kind of music work hard on that. Um, and, and that's an, another kind of classical mindset that, that, um, I think we need to change that, um, there are other kinds of music worth, um, taking seriously, both as a listener and also as a performer. And it's, it's strange to assume that since you have all this training in this one tradition, that training will 
automatically translate to any other tradition. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, my, uh, my resume is not going to help me uh, play a convincing blues or, or like lock into a, a hip hop beat or, you know, I, I, I've got to do the work and uh, treat it with that same respect that I would would treat um, uh, that I would be expected to treat uh, Beethoven or, or Brahms. Right. Absolutely. Well, for, for those of you who are on social media, if you check out, uh, there's a on Facebook, you can go to Kenji Bunch Composer. And, uh, and just if you search for Kenji Bunch Composer, you can see some of these videos and they're, they're, they're really uh, joyful and virtuosic at the same time, which I mean, virtuosity is about joy a lot of times, but I just find there's a kind of unbridled joy here that, and willingness to just go for it and, and uh, make music in a meaningful way that it's just so, so powerful. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, one other piece that Yosa has played, the Yosa Philharmonic a few years ago on a concert with Branford Marsalis as our guest artist played your orchestral work, Super Maximum, which is a brilliant bluesy tone poem that features the viola section, especially, mm -hmm. I would say, and uh, really a great piece that we had a tremendous time playing. Our audience loved it. Um, but the story of that piece is, is a story about American history that, that was really compelling. And uh, it's a piece that, that in some ways draws inspiration from the singing of prison gangs, of, of chain gangs working and singing while they work. Um, and I wonder if you could just tell us either more about that piece or just in general in your work about how you draw inspiration from uh, history and especially from questions of racial justice in American history. Yeah, um, again, it, it wasn't really something that I decided I would do. It would, I, I just sort of drifted in that direction and found myself drawn to, to uh, these stories. Um, the way Super Maximum came about, I, I came across a recording of uh, the uh, Lomax, uh, John and Al Alan Lomax, uh, who did so much field recording. Um, and I, I believe their archive is accessible uh, through the Smithsonian. It's, it's a, there's some amazing stuff there. But in any case, they had recorded actual chain gangs uh, down in the, the deep south in uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, um, at these uh, prison uh, farm uh, work programs where uh, inmates were working and uh, singing that they, they uh, develop these work songs. And um, I did more reading about that, uh, both that situation uh, in, in those prisons and about the work songs in particular. And it, it was just uh, a really amazing story. Um, you know, first of all, it turned out that uh, many of the prisoners there were um, were brought in on trumped up charges uh, as part of the, the the Jim Crow South. They they were effectively they were, they were looking for people who would be good uh, workers. It was like a, a replacement for for slavery, uh, finding people to work for free. And if you arrested them and forced them to work in a in a prison chain gang. That was a way you can get free labor. Um, then uh, the the songs themselves, I found, came out of the African work song tradition. Um, but uh, so they've got that that modality of uh, of those West African songs. But uh, what was really amazing about it was the the reason they would sing while they were working was um, whoever was the slowest at swinging an ax or whatever the job was, uh, would get whipped. And so they realized if they were all singing in, in rhythm, it would keep their cadence, uh, they would all be swinging at the same pace. 
And so it, they did that out of survival and protection. Uh, and then the larger issue emerged, which was that uh, here are, are people whose humanity has been denied them. Um, and they re are responding to that circumstance, not with violence, but with art. And that, that it's, it's through art that they're surviving and um, transcending this experience. And so that, that was kind of the, the inspiration for Super Maximum. Well, it's a great piece of music. And like so much of your work, Kenji, it, it has brought me just a lot of joy and a lot of solace and a lot of thoughtfulness, a lot of, you know, prompts to say, you know, what, what, is, what does the concert hall mean? Or what is, uh, what is American history mean? And viola players, you all have to check out Kenji's solo viola music. There's a piece called the three G's that's kind of become legendary in the viola world, especially, <laughs> but there's a whole bunch of great, great repertoire. Kenji, I wish we could just keep going forever, but at some point uh, we're gonna have to stop. So I'm gonna say, thank you for being with us today. I wanna ask everybody to keep coming back. Next Sunday, we're gonna have Akiko Fujimoto, who's the associate conductor of the Minnesota Orchestra and the music director of the Mid-Texas Symphony. Akiko used to be the associate conductor of the San Antonio Symphony and has actually conducted the Yosef Philharmonic on several occasions in the past. So we're excited to have her come back and talk about her own career as a conductor. And then in two weeks from today, we're gonna to have electric violinist and composer, Tracy Silverman, who collaborated okay. with Kenji on the Embrace project um, and uh, was a, is, a, is a wonderful guy to talk to too. Keep coming back every Sunday through the end of July as we explore musicians and their journeys. Um, Kenji, any closing thoughts? Anything you wanna share with us on the way out today? Um, it, just uh, one, one thought about you were mentioning the, the uh, virtuosity in some of that stuff I, I've been playing. And um, uh, I, I think what I, I want to express with, with those um, videos and with, with my playing is not, not what I look at what I can do, it's look at what we can do. And, um, you know, I'm just this one random violist uh, but uh, anybody can, I, I guess I wanted to celebrate the potential of our instruments and, and of, of us um, approaching them creatively. And uh, let's, let's use this uh, unusual amount of, of time on our hands to explore those instruments fearlessly and uh, try stuff out. Maybe it'll not work at all, but uh, what's the harm in trying? That's great. Thank you so much.